Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large. And this is Ruth McLeod, the Southern Atheist. And we are coming to you for our 21st episode. Woo! We are legal now. No. <laughs> we can drink. What? <laughs> we can... That doesn't make sense. I know. I'm ridiculous. I am I am utterly ridiculous right now. In, we have turned 21. No. the it, 21 weeks. It, like, it's, it's a weird kid. Like, well, oh, just, he's 21 weeks old. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I just, I, I'm weird. I, I'm weird. And we are also um, celebrating, actually, we, we're celebrating many, many things here at the Sensibly Speaking Studios. Um, because it has now been a week that my book has been out, yeah, and uh, it's and it's been selling, and Yay. it's been exciting to watch the little sales on a daily basis because I'm just kind of obsessive about that and yeah, looking sure stuff are. up and and, and you're, uh, you're getting some shout outs from some really awesome people. Oh my god, that's right. I wasn't even going to talk about that, but that's true. I sent an email to Michael Shermer who is the editor of Skeptic.com, Skeptic, Ma- mm-hmm. Skeptic Magazine. Skeptic Magazine. One of my first Skeptic heroes. No, tell me about it. I Anything he writes, I gobble up. I love it. Yeah. he Well, because he's written Why People Think Weird Things. Yes. And he wrote The Moral. Why People Believe Weird Things. Weird, yeah. yeah, that's right. Why mm-hmm. People Believe mm-hmm. Weird Things. Mm-hmm. And he wrote The Moral Arc, which yes. has to do with morality and without God. And, and he was on know. an episode of Penn & Teller, which is where I learned about him, actually. And he was fantastic. I love it. Yeah, and he's done some. He's done some really great debates. He did make an interesting point. I uh, thought about um, about atheism. Of course, he pushes an atheist platform. Yes. Where he says, you know, he he brings up a point, which I, you know, I, I can see the. It's an interesting point of, of he says, okay, so all of you people here in this room who believe in God have chosen not to believe in, say, Odin and Quetzalcoatl and. Vishnu and you know there's like Kumbaya. thousands mm-hmm. of gods mm-hmm. that have existed throughout time and you do not believe in any of them so you're atheists as far as that goes right and he says I'm just asking you to take it one step further exactly just one more god yeah you know so you know it's funny whenever I tell my religious family that little argument they kind of look at me appalled. <laughs> like, how dare I put that label on them for right. anything? <laughs> right. What? I'm not an atheist. What do you mean? Well, a- well, do you believe in Odin? No. Well, then you're an atheist well, about Odin. Exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. But I, you know, anyway, it's uh, it's all fun and games. But he has um, a voice and he has um, a lot of credibility. And I've really, really admired him because he was one of the first exposures I had to the whole skeptical, critical thinking line of reasoning. What he had done was through Skeptic Magazine, he had put out some issues and some articles, which I actually ordered from his from Skeptic Magazine and still have, that talk about and develop the ideas of Carl Sagan and, and rational arguments. Mm-hmm. Like he put out a thing on the baloney detection kit, right. which was a Carl Sagan standard from book the demon haunted world it's a chapter in that book so uh, michael Shermer wrote a whole article on that Mm -hmm. and expanded upon it right and that was one of my first exposures to critical thinking good way to start yeah Yeah. so i wrote him an email about my book and i said in my email hey man you might not know this in fact there's no way you would know this but you were one of my earliest influences and helping me to recover from scientology and I expanded on, you know, how that was the case. And apparently that was exactly the right thing to say because he responded to my email within 10 minutes and said, can I reproduce this email on, on our social media to show what, you know, what we do, the effectiveness of what we do? And I said, of course, I wasted zero time in answering him <laughs> back saying, absolutely, of Please course you can. Do this. Yes. And then he asked me for the links to where my book is purchasable. And he, to my shock tweeted out my entire email so you can find it on twitter yep and then he tweeted out my name and the links to my book yep uh to his eighty nine thousand followers and it even went on to his his facebook because that's actually where i saw it ah because i'm not a big twitter person right so needless to say i was mondo happy about that (laughs) because that was quite a, a wonderful shout out and of course, I've got, you know, I'm looking at booking some radio and I'm trying to get on po- other podcasts 
and uh, any other media I can get onto. Yeah. You know, and arranging book signings and various things and, and whatever else I can do to promote the hell out of this book because I want everybody to read it. My copy is sitting in my mailbox right now. And I'm really upset that I'm here right now with you <laughs> instead of at my damn mailbox. <sighs> well, we'll get you there. So, and I had the wonderful experience of autographing my very first book this week. Really? Yes. Damn yeah. it. I wanted it to be me. No. Who yeah, took you're this be... away from me? Which one of you did it? <laughs> Yeah, guy Steve Aldrich and his wife. They, yeah. He got my book and and he uh, he got me to sign it. Fine. And I tell you, it's a little bit of a weird experience to autograph something. To write your <laughs> yeah, name. They're like, what? You want what? It's like, I'm not signing <laughs> like a legal document. Am right. I? <laughs> what, what is this? You know. So cool. anyway, that was a lot of fun. So this has been a fun week and um, lots more happening. This is, of course, also New Year's week. We are coming at you today is day New Year's Eve. We yes. record this, but we, of course, you'll be listening to this the day after New Year's. It will be well into the beginning hours of 2016. That's weird. It's going to take me about six months to finally get <laughs> I'm writing checks with the wrong year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It'll be great. I am really looking forward to, to this new year and all the, the things I'm... I'm expecting it to bring big, big projects. Yeah. I've got, uh, personally, I've got ideas for two more books. Uh, We'll see what happens with those. And some other really big projects on the horizon, some of which are already going, but I can't talk about yet. Yep. But there's some really cool stuff happening. And of course, you know, the the expansion of this podcast and um, YouTube, you know, just a lot going on here. So I think this is going to be a a banner year. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. So... Good things. So what kind of traditions did you have in bringing in the new year? In- you know, it's it's weird that, you know, my family has so many traditions and I thought they were regular traditions that everyone <laughs> did. And then she asked me and I'm like, what? Yeah, I asked you, do you do the New Year's breakfast or, or not New Year's breakfast, are you going to do the New Year's dinner? And you kind of blank stared at me. Right, totally. What? what? <laughs> so... And I guess it it really just is a southern thing, but I don't know. I thought somebody knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am nobody, so it doesn't really count. Yeah. What my family, what we do is we have cornbread, which represents gold. You have green beans. No, I'm sorry, not green beans. Black eyed peas. That represents uh, coinage money. Uh, then you have collard greens, or we usually did cabbage, and that represents paper money. And then... Um, you have some kind of pork product, which has uh, represents prosperity and good luck and, and all this. And we would normally do ham. Some people do pulled pork. Some people will do... Uh, I've seen people do corned beef hash. And then sometimes you would take the collard greens and the beans and you mix them up with some rice. It's called hop and john. And some people actually will end up making a gumbo out of stuff like that. So that's that's kind of what I grew up eating every New Year's Day. And I'm actually, I don't think I'm going to do it this year because obviously, you know, it's just a silly thing. It, it, it's never worked. Let's just put it this way. It's never freaking <laughs> worked. It didn't. <laughs> I'm always broke. Come on now. I, didn't, I don't even understand. <laughs> Symbolically eating all of your money is probably... Exactly. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Well, actually, um, they used to put like a dime in the pot. Old, old, old thing. Wow. We obviously don't do it anymore. I mean, we don't even put babies in king cakes anymore, even though we freaking should. Wow, you, your face. <laughs> ba- ba- what? Babies? Like little plastic babies. Oh, in I've king never, cakes. Yeah, no, never heard of that. I'll get you a king cake this year. I am so, yeah, I am so. Anyway, this so is the loop. Eat. This is me. <laughs> Big gap in between. No, so they would put like dimes in in with the black eyed peas. And so whoever in the pot got the dime, that, you know, that's kind of. That but is then, so funny. But then people, of course, choke on stuff and tourists don't know how to eat food and they choke. <laughs> wow. But yeah, so, so yeah, the the whole cornbread and the, and the, it's usually cooked cabbage and, you know, collard greens, things like that. Oh, that was always huh. the meal that I've literally had every New Year's Day since I was a kid. I, and I've never even, uh, never heard of that. Really? Yeah, not That's at all. That's surprising to me that a lot of, have you ever heard of groom's cakes? Nope. 
Wow. What's a what's a groom's cake? It's a wedding thing. Uh huh. So when two people get married, <laughs> yeah, uh, you have like the traditional wedding cake. Yes, that I definitely know about. Right, and it's usually you know the 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 female or the chick or will go through and um, pick out most of the decorations and cakes and crap like that, and the guy just shows up in a tux. Yeah, pretty much. Groom's cake is basically the groom's cake, and it's usually like a one sheet like flat cake. And they they decorate it and do whatever they want. Like they go to their own bakery and say, I want a cake to look like this. There's a... Really? Did you ever see Steel Magnolias? Nope. They made a groom's cake in the shape of an armadillo? Nope. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No. Never saw Steel Magnolias. I I guess I'm so ignorant of the ways of the South in terms of this cultural stuff. Well, there's also the pulls out of the wedding cake. The, the, The what? Well, okay. Any... Any girl that is um, unmarried, uh-huh. any single girl, uh, in the cake, in the little different layers, there are these little tags, and they have like these little uh, ribbons on them, and you, the, you got to have like, I, oh, gosh, I can't think of the number of it right now. Seven, it's either seven or nine girls come up and they pull on these things, and um, you know they'll say things like wealth or good luck or something like that, and really? so you know they they pull them off, and whichever one you. You pull off, that's, you know, what you get. It's like a wishbone kind of thing. Oh, okay. I, wow. No. Never heard of okay, any of this so stuff. Okay, so apparently the South is just full of ridiculous no, traditions. This is, yeah, I completely, I mean, well, yes, but that's just very and, interesting. And it's funny, I never really thought of my myself and my family as traditional people. Very much I so, I see. I have a lot of traditions. Yeah. And I'm actually probably not going to do the uh, traditional dinner tomorrow. Okay. Just because... I'm staying at my boss's house for a while. I'm kind right. of house sitting, and so right. I don't know her kitchen as well as mine, and all that stuff. So I right, probably right. do that. But huh, it's, it's weird. <laughs> it is interesting, probably how there are things we've just grown up with, and because it's just perfectly natural to us, it's perfectly acceptable. There's like, it, it, how else would it be? Yeah, that this is how life is. Yeah, this and, is what you do. And we all have our holiday. I guess the traditions really, you know, a lot of them probably focus or center around holiday activities. Right. You know, the orange juice before getting up to have the Christmas presents. Yeah. That was something we tried to put in for like once or twice. <laughs> now, hold on, Chris. Let's have some orange juice you first. I was need like, to have some vitamin C. Why am I doing this? You're like, going to eat chocolate for the, the rest presents. of the damn day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give me the presents. So, we, yeah, so we my tried. Used to make wake us up with bells. Wow! I, yeah, just these little things. All we, these little you know, things. We all. Yeah, I think I think it was room. a big fail on my family on trying to establish traditions because I kept busting them up. I, well, but, that's your yeah, own damn fault. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. But you know, in terms of New Year's traditions, though, having um, one thing I did have is we grew up in uh, Pasadena, California, uh-huh. and that was we were literally about a mile, mile and a half away from where they build all of the floats for the Rose Parade. Yeah, that's cool. And so the night before the Rose Parade happens, New Year's Eve, all those floats have to go get in place. Yeah. And then the parade starts first thing in the morning. So all the floats drove right by our house. Wow. So we got the whole Rose Parade right in front of us. That's really cool. Yeah, they'd all fly by. And, um, and, of course, it wasn't all lit up and everything, but it was still all the floats. Yeah, you can still see them. We just wow. watched them all drive by us. And then, uh, of course, New Year's morning, we'd wake up and, and watch the Rose Parade. And it was a big deal. So the, the Rose Parade do, it's just flowers, right? Like all the floats are made of flowers. All the floats are, are, are decorated with uh, varying colors of rose petals. Okay. And they're quite beautiful. I mean, they're just oh, amazing sure. what they do. And they just spend months gluing these rose petals onto all of these floats. Do they do they throw stuff from the floats? The kind of parades I'm used to, they throw stuff. Oh yeah, like yeah. Doubloons and beads and Yeah, stuff. I don't I don't know. No. I don't remember that happening. I feel like particularly. they would they would float they not float. They would throw flowers. That's right. I I'm quite sure they probably do. Yeah. I mean now that I think about that's, it. That's probably, what I would think. Yeah. And it's a big deal and it's televised of course yeah, every yeah, year yeah, yeah. and all that and and um you know what rolls Rose Bowl, right? Well, yeah. It's, there's the Rose Parade, and then there's the Rose Bowl. Okay. And that happens. That's a college football game that happens in the right. Rose Bowl. Right. Which was also a, a mile and a half from our house. That's yeah. where I grew up. Yeah. Because the Rose, where they build the floats, was sort of in a, a large building that was uh, basically across the street from the Rose Bowl. Okay. 
Of course, there's a big green way and everything in between, but right. that's that's basically where it is. Okay. So okay. So you know, Pasadena, City of Roses. You yeah. know, this sort of thing. All right. Now, another thing I wanted to uh, mention as we're rolling along here is uh, a couple movies. You know, we've never really talked about movies on this show, but I am a huge cinephile. Yes, you are. Love movies. Seriously, when when you and I and, like, some other people go out, and then you and Robbie getting into, like, a movie thing, and I'm just like, you know what? Just abandon their conversation. <laughs> Let them have their movie conversation, because it's going to go on for about three hours. I do love me some movies. <laughs> and, um, and this last week, uh, you saw Joy. I did. And so did I. And what did you, this is the new Jennifer Lawrence movie. And what did you think well, of I, it? Well, I went with a, a, with a group of girlfriends and um, I expected something different. Like the the actual trailer for it made it seem like it was going to be more funny. Mm. And there were some funny parts in there. I love Robert De Niro. I'm a big fan of his. It was more of a depressing kind of thing throughout. It was, wasn't it? It really it was. was. Kinda, it, it was, was bit, different than what I thought. Yeah, it was kind of dark. Yeah. I, I felt bad for her the entire way through. Exactly. I mean, she the, the character is based on a real life person. Yes. Whose name escapes me right now. Joy something or other. Um, I can't pronounce it. Yeah. She's, she's a wonderful woman and a brilliant success story. And she's invented... Tons of, of, you know, home products mm-hmm. that people use. This yeah. mop, the self, you know. We had one of these mops growing up. Yeah. So, yeah. This, yeah. so this mop that she invented was what got her started on, and she started selling it on QVC and, and doing it herself, which was unusual at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she made it kind of big, and then she invented more things. And I was just at Target yesterday buying some uh, storage stuff and right there were her coat hangers these, huh. these velvet covered yeah, yeah, coat yeah. hangers right uh, so her stuff's very much out there oh, yeah. and uh, she's got like you know 10 billion patents or something and she sells this stuff yeah. and and now she's become her own sort of industry so the yeah. movie is sort of loosely based on her yeah the thing that was so dark about it for me was not just the struggles that she was going through and trying to go through what every entrepreneur goes through. Right. You know, just because you have an idea, executing that idea, it takes work. It takes a lot of perseverance, yep. uh, a lot of guts, and a lot of overcoming barriers. And that's true for all of us who are trying to make our way in the world, right? right. But her family was so horrible in yeah. this movie. Yeah. Her, she, you know, her, her father, her mother, who's basically mentally ill yeah right her sister who's got this jealous weird thing going on yeah. i mean just really nasty yeah, evil I, kind of stuff you know I, from the beginning i'm like this girl is this lunatic yeah. yeah and it was just not it wasn't it wasn't pleasant to watch the family interaction because the character of joy was a very giving person yes and made incredible sacrifices to you know, help her father, help her, the business, um, like she was doing all the books all the time and right. stuff like that, right? In addition to being a single mother, mm-hmm. and her ex is living in her basement yeah, at that the was beginning weird. of the movie, uh, no, right? Mm-hmm. And then her dad moves in, just, you know, just shows up, hey, I'm living here now, and you're like, I'm, I'm just trying what? To, I'm trying to picture my father and one of my exes living together. Right. <laughs> I mean, I don't have an ex-husband, but I'm thinking... Of a few choice exes that I would like to see my father in the same room with. <laughs> right. But it's just, I don't think I would be able to have a peaceful household. Right. I mean. And she didn't. Oh, you no. know, her household no, was no. insane. No. And this was all her sort of being the peacekeeper slash care provider slash moral support. And right. then... And then it becomes her turn to try to, you know, show some initiative and do what she wants to do. And she gets support, but it's kind of always at a price. Yeah. And there's always little caveats and tags and, you know, these little sneering sort of comments from her sister, especially who just backstabs her left, right, and center. And <sighs> Anyway, just a lot of struggles there. So, yeah. you know, how much of that's reality-based, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I read something you know. that was kind of contrary to that it's a true story it's right it's more of a they took key issues that she had to go with and key issues that other women entrepreneurs had to go through with and just kind of jammed it all together which you know is to be expected when it when something is you know twisted by hollywood but it was 
It was an interesting movie. I, I enjoyed it. And it was made by David O. Russell, who wrote and directed it. And he's, of course, the same guy who did American Hustle and Silver Linings Playbook. One of those I actually saw. I saw Silver Linings Playbook. I did not see American Hustle. Oh. I did not enjoy Sil- Silver Linings Playbook. Okay. I have not seen Silver Linings Playbook. Mm-hmm. Don't kill me. Don't judge me. I hear you out there judging me. Don't judge me. They're probably judging us of why we're the hell we're talking about. I'm just, movies right now. Well, because, because it's New Year's Eve and we're And done. because movies are awesome, so <laughs> shut up and listen. But American Hustle was an awesome movie. I enjoyed it greatly. I saw it uh, like two or three times. And um, same, you know, team here on Joy. And so if you like that style of filmmaking and that, that kind of uh, the cinematic way that David O. Russell does things, then you will enjoy Joy. So, <laughs> also, you, you love just slipping in those dad jokes when you can do I it. just, I do, I do. I'm just daddy o. So, uh, another awesome movie that I cannot recommend enough, and um, Ruth hasn't seen this one, but no. uh, The Big Short. I saw this, uh, I saw this this week. Absolutely amazing movie. Yeah. Yes, brilliantly. Um, educational, uh, and overtly so. They break down the fourth wall. There's a lot of talking to the audience. Okay. Um, and they use celebrity cameos to explain complex economic and Wall Street uh, uh, concepts okay. in very, very simple terms so that you get it. Because the one of the points that they made early in the movie, the movie is about the Wall Street housing crash uh, the bubble b- burst, right, in, in 2007, 2008, when everything collapsed. Right. And exactly precisely why that happened, all the events that led up to it, that made it happen, and a small group of people who saw it coming, and I'm talking about, like, literally a handful of people who, who you know, there, there was a particular um, investment, econo- you know, economist uh-huh. who predicted it, Mm-hmm. Some other guys saw that he had done that and saw that he was right and then took action to um, benefit from it. Right. And which is what the big short is. They, you know, they did this, they did this uh, short sale. Right. Um, but the way the movie is laid out is it, it holds your interest the entire time despite these large complex economic issues because it explains them in very simple terms using Selena Gomez. <laughs> and Anthony Burdone and like these these celebrity cameos, people just show up and they go and to explain this, here's celebrity chef Anthony Burdone and he and he explains this entire concept uh, using lobsters, using pieces of, of lobster, right and leftover pieces of lobster to explain how uh, these bonds, how junk bonds are created, right and um, and then they, you know, then you have Selena Gomez explaining synthetic, you know, th- th- anyway, this whole other concept. So the point made early in the movie is that these things are very convoluted, complex, hard to understand issues, but actually that's all bullshit because it's just made to look that way by Wall Street so that they look like they're doing something intelligent <laughs> when in fact, 99% of these people have no clue what they are doing. On, a, on any kind of medium or long-term basis. It's all about make money, make money, make money. And it is a fascinating and kind of a bit of a punch to the gut study in human nature. That's my takeaway from this movie is, is watching how people act and really wondering, you know, when you get to the end of this movie and you see what, what really happened in the real world. This movie is not not bullshit there's nothing going on in this movie that didn't really happen and it's funny because even even the the couple little parts in the movie where they change something that actually happened for the sake of the movie they tell you they just changed it you know like there's this one part where these two stock guys are in the lobby of you know i don't know merrill lynch or something and they just happen to see the study talking about the coming crash Mm -hmm. and they go hey what's this and they pick it up and read it and go oh my god this guy has a point and then ryan gosling who's narrating the movie comes on and says yeah they didn't really find the prospectus in the middle of the lobby of merrill lynch 
what they did was they actually saw this magazine article, which led to a phone call, which led to them finding out about it. But for <laughs> the sake of the movie, we just put it in the lobby, right? Wow. So they tell you this as, the, as they're going, right? But it's a fascinating character study in the kind of people who manage our money. Yeah. Right? And I say our money because look at where the money at Wall Street comes from. It comes from us. Yeah. Right? And then they get this at the very end, of course. You know, these banks are literally collapsing. Terrifying, really. I mean, it was another 1929 crash right happening right in front of us. Right. And the government did a bailout. Well, guess whose money they used? Right. Right? Everyone's. And Yeah, exactly. And these guys got this, this very hefty uh, bailout. And you come to realize, you know, when you get to the end of something like this, that this is representative of just one area, economics and Wall Street and banking. But you see that our nature... You know, our short-sighted thinking, our, you know, do something for the immediate benefit, don't think about the consequences, don't even look at the consequences, don't wonder what's, where am I going to be a year from now or two years from now or what, what you know, these guys who were lending people money to buy houses were sharks. I mean, these people were just, they just didn't even care that there was no collateral, that these people weren't good for the loans. Mm -hmm. They were just flipping houses, you know, three, right. four, five times with no thought at all that there was going to be an end of the line. Right. You couldn't just keep doing this. Right. So it really, really accurately portrays that and shows that we, you know, whether you want to take that same kind of thinking to our climate, our political structure, you know, our social issues, mm -hmm. Right, you you can you can make these these parallels and these these um, comparatives, and it's not really a very pretty picture. Everything's going to come to a head eventually. That's... Well, that's kind of what the movie shows. Yeah, is that things do come to a head, and then what do you do about it? Right, right. What happens as a result? And unfortunately, the solution that occurred appeared from the information to hand to just continue the problem. I wonder if I can right. go and ask for a handout from the government. Well, billion dollars. <laughs> okay, can you do that for me, Tad? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that'll happen. So, I'll a very in. very educational movie. I cannot recommend it enough. I'll chip in my own you know. part for the billion. You know, whatever. It's yeah. my taxes too. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. Oh jeez. Well, I'll, I'll expect a, a a piece of that pie when that what? billion comes your way. Oh what? yeah. What? Oh yeah, don't forget us little people. The lotto is three hundred million right now, dude. Huh. Just saying. Cool. So I don't see, play the lotto. That's pretty <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't win if you don't play. Well I I don't need an extra tax on, on myself. Thank mm, you very much. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, folks, see the big short if you can. Um I can't recommend it enough. And I would actually love to hear um in the comments. Uh, I would actually really like to hear what people out there think about it and what your takeaway from it was. Because I actually, uh, if I haven't made it clear, I actually feel like it's an important movie and one that really should be sort of mandatory viewing for all Americans so that they kind of understand what just happened to us not so many years ago and what and, could easily happen again. Yep. Just, just so easily. Um, simply out of ignorance. Yeah. You know, because that is what it is. It is ignorance. It's not... And this also brings to mind another point, actually, since I'll just harp on this for a minute, you know, with the conspiracy theorists and whatnot, right? This, mm -hmm. you know, it really highlighted... What's that saying? Never attribute to conspiracy what you can easily assign to stupidity. Something like that, like, or never assign to evil what you can, what is easily explainable by stupidity. I mean, it was just sheer stupidity okay, 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 that yeah. made this happen. And people look at these things and go, uh, oh, it's some big, vast conspiracy. Well, no. It, I mean, yes, there it's was conspiracy occurring amongst certain people to profit by certain things. But there was no conspiracy to crash the market. Nobody wanted that. Yeah, it's that just... wasn't the end goal of anybody. It was just through sheer stupidity that that happened, hmm. and that and this movie really dis. I mean, it did it to you straight 
fact by fact by fact by fact, starting from the very beginning. You know, here's one guy who has this one idea, um, and that idea then takes hold and then grows and builds and becomes this whole other thing, and it gets corrupted and twisted around, and then you have this bubble created, you know, 25 years later right. that practically brings down the entire economy. There so so I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed watching that process, watching it so easily and clearly explained, and I would love to hear your feedback on it for those of you who have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, go see it and then give me your feedback. I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you liked it. Uh, you know, I how do you, how do you tell? I, you can read me so well. So we're going to do a smaller version of our news uh, segment this week. So do 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 do. Take it away, Ruth. The hell was that? <laughs> that was my impromptu news intro. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's what that was. Okay. Yeah, you can look at me like that. But I'm, I'm I, I see the jealousy. At... Yeah, I see it. Jealousy? Okay. Oh, yeah, I see it. I see it. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. What, whatever you did, want did, to continue. Did, did you have some news to share? You know what? <laughs> Your delusion is getting the best of you today. Do you understand? <laughs> You are listening to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. Isn't it about time someone made some sense around here? All right. This is um, an article that I found from MSNBC. Um, It's from the Rachel Maddow Show Uh um, from her blog. It's actually not written by her. It's written by a man named Steve Benin. Uh Um, And so this is something I've heard about kind of off and on for the last couple of weeks i didn't really give it much thought yeah i've been um, sort of cross flowing it in the news yeah it's yeah. it's it's kind of popped up on a few uh, secular sites here and there so um arizona has actually um appointed a woman her name is um sylvia allen she's a senator she's and a she, senator yeah she's she's a republican from snowflake arizona which always makes me giggle just a little um <laughs> but she is now the chairwoman of the Senate Education Committee. And that would normally be fine, good, great, dandy. Um, except for uh, Miss Allen um, is best known for her controversial public comments um, about how the earth is only 6,000 years old. Her public comments on the matter. Yes. Um, so she's not only a, a young earth creationist, yeah, she... But she's an outspoken young earth creationist. Yeah, and she's made comments, um, Facebook posts about chemtrail conspiracies. Uh. Um, she also, and this is the one that really, really gets to me, she made comments sh- suggesting a mandatory church attendance. Okay. For all Americans, not just people in Snowflake. Okay. Um, wow. So... Here's here's a nice little quote from Miss Allen. Um, she she basically said that uh, she w- she wanted to return to the 1950s, saying, "quote People prayed, people went to church. I remember on Sundays the stores were closed. The biggest thing is religion was kicked out of our public places and uh, out of our public schools." End quote. Um, so she. When it comes to uh, the mandatory church attendance, she basically has said, it doesn't matter what church you go to, she's not going to make you go to a specific one, but she wants you to go to one because that would bring back the moral, or it would it would fix the moral erosion of the soul of America, is kind of what she says. So I, don't, I wouldn't care that this woman was appointed uh, to basically be an educational leader. Um, the person who basically decides what gets passes and what doesn't, educationally speaking. But, and everyone is allowed to have their own personal beliefs about things. She wants to believe in chemtrails, by all means, believe in chemtrails. If she thinks everyone should go to church, by all means, continue to think that people should go to church on a Sunday. If you want to think the world is 6,000 years old and basically slap every scientist in the face, that's fine. You can be off by 4.5 billion years all you want. The problem is... She is making efforts to make this into a reality for every American. 
And while she has admitted that that's not something that she can actually push onto people, it's not something that's allowed, she does think that our country needs to stop this moral decay that we have of America's soul. And now an, she's making educational decisions, and that's that's what concerns me. It's an interesting point of view, and I will look at or look. I will comment on the fact that I get what she's trying to do, and I get where she's coming from, and I can actually agree with her to a. How do I put this? Uh, what? No, hear me out here. Uh, you better. I get what she, here's okay. I get the problem that she's trying to solve, and I get where she's coming from. I think she's looking at the wrong, uh, what do you call them, triggers? I think she's looking at the wrong sources of the problem, because she considers that that a lack of religion is behind the moral decay of the United States. I would just like to point out that it was around 1950s or so that we started putting in God we trust on everything. Exactly. And that's when everything started to erode. Right. So that, No, you're, 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 you're dead on right there. I may have seen that right. on a meme somewhere. You so did. So that's what but, I'm running off on. Yeah, but, but I mean, I'm not going to claim that one for myself, but it's <laughs> right. totally true. No, I don't believe for a second that it is lack of religion that is behind the moral decay of, of the United States. Now, when you talk about moral decay, you need to be a bit more precise about that. And one of the problems I have with people who take this position is these broad sweeping generalities of everything's going to hell in a handbasket. We're Mm -hmm. not the same great country we used to be and all of this sort of nonsense, this sort of conservative view. And I don't mean conservative politically. I mean the, the, the definition of the word conservative. It goes meaning... You want to conserve. You want to go back to how things used to be. Mm. The idea being that things were better back in the day than they are now. Depends and on who you the, were con- back in the day. Well, that's exactly right, and it's and it's a it's a big discussion, so we don't have to get into the whole thing right now. But right. I'm seeing that you know I'm not seeing evil in this woman. In other words, is what I'm saying. I see that she's trying to solve problems that she thinks are legitimate problems, and You're there are the ignorance in this woman. I'm seeing very. I'm seeing a lot of ignorance in this woman, right? right? Um, from my more science-based views, you know, young. I I can't. You know, to me, young Earth creationism is on par with flat earthers. I mean, it's, you, you'd have to be, you have to ignore so many pieces of factual information to believe such a thing that it's not even worth a, an intellectual discussion. Right. right? But it, the thing is about this woman, though, is she has these beliefs, and I've already said. She's totally allowed to have these beliefs. I mean, and you, there's, and that was, there's no yeah. one even questioning that. That's right. Of course. Is she the type of person who will let her personal beliefs get in the way of other people's education? And that's where I have a big problem, too. Yeah. That's Yeah. I'm trying to look at things from her point of view for a minute to just sort of like see if I can give her the benefit of the doubt of anything. Because it's easy to come down on somebody like that for you or me right. and go... You know, what a stupid whore, right? You know, just Jesus Christ. I mean, come Really? On, you gotta go whore? Why? Well, I, just, I know, wasn't I just, going whore. Nobody I said just, whore. I just, well, it's... it's if a, anything, wow. she's she's so conservative, she probably <laughs> hasn't had any kind of sexual in, encounters in a very long time. Uh, Who knows? Uh, it, I don't know. It was just I'm, like the nastiest word I could... We're not going to go after her could, sexuality on this one, Chris. It was just the nastiest word I could think of. What? Anyway. So really and, and couldn't I'm, have just gone cunt. I'm wow. That's a really bad one. For well, me. I'm not calling her any of those things. I was trying to look at her position and go, well, is there anything about this I can give any credence to? I'm a good feminist. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, I can look at what she's trying to do and see the problem she's trying to solve and say, okay, I can get on board with some of that how she's going about solving those problems or how she thinks what she thinks is causing those problems i can't get behind at all right right so i will say good intention horrible awful completely wrong headed execution right is is was pretty much what i, I can grant her i don't know her intention so i can't well, she, according to what we've read here, she's trying to make the world a better place. So she wants the world to be a better well, place. Well, she thinks or, that the, the, moral, you know. the morality of America is decaying, and I completely disagree with her. Okay, fair enough. So that's I, why... I think that there are certain issues or problems that are... This is why I said at the very beginning that these generalities are very hard, because you yeah. can interpret it many different ways. Yeah. 
I agree that there are certain things she would say are immoral that you and I don't right. call immoral, right? For example, LGBT rights. She's, I'm sure, having a tizzy about that. Yeah, we're she wants to go back to the 50s, so right. she doesn't even want civil rights. Like Right. So we're fine. So we're tracking on that. I look at things like I go, okay, well, to me, what would the moral decay of the United States entail? And I would look at things like a growing drug problem. And I would say that there are moral issues there. See, I, right? I don't know if I, def- I would put the, the moniker of moral decay on there. I think... We have some societal decay, yeah. Sure. Well, and but and which the, which the moral those... is 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 one of those terms that can be seen differently. So I, I... oh, all right. I mean, I, just to just to finish that argument, when a person takes drugs or becomes addicted to drugs, they will, you know, inevi- almost inevitably lead to criminality. Mm. We see that pattern. It's documented pattern. It's not controversial for me to say that when a person gets addicted to drugs and they run out of money. They start looking for other ways to get money what to kind continue of drugs the drug problem. About? I'm talking about heavy drugs. I'm not like, talking about marijuana. I'm talking drugs. about heroin, okay. right? Meth. Okay. Because I, I, I would just argue that right? drugs can be a, a great plethora of many things. So right, but when we're talking about when I've, she's talking, I've, about... I've never ripped somebody off so I can buy cable. I'm sorry, but right. it kind of is my drug. I and I don't I don't have cable in my house, but now that I'm watching somebody else's house and they have cable, I really want it. <laughs> okay. Well, but, cable but, and and meth are two different things. Yeah. No, but I'm saying it physiologically they're, they're, creates. You know. No. 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 The, the the only point that I'm saying here is that you know you 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 were trying to be careful with word and not using a, a blanket statement for something. Yeah. But I, I'm basically just showing you how any word, obviously now, can be seen in many different ways. Which so, is so yeah. So these drugs, I I'm not going to go rip off a convenience store so I can have cable. But cable can be seen as a drug for some people. Oh, okay. Soda can be seen as a drug for some people. Yeah. Well, this is why we have to define our terms. Exactly. And, that's and what that's, I'm And that's my objection with her stance, again, which is, again, which I led in with. Right. Is, you know, it's not, it, it, it's so open to interpretation, these broad statements that some of these, you know, people make. Right. And I'm talking about anybody. Conservatives and liberals, politicians, we people on social platforms. I mean, we so, just, yeah. yeah, yeah so seriously. anybody can yeah. do this. Which, which is, which is why I argue with your using the word of moral decay. I, I yeah, don't, fair I don't see it. Fair enough. So, morality is relative anyway. So, some somebody might see it as decaying, and some people don't. So, I don't even like putting the word morality on an American culture just because it's okay. Fair enough. So, it's a big, big topic. It is lots of subtopics there. Lots of lots of discussion points. In, this in, was my this was my poorly thought out effort <laughs> <laughs> to try to not just jump all over this woman's shit and actually try to look at a different perspective for a moment. Well, and and you know, and Ruth has brought up all valid points and of I, I don't poking jump, holes into that. I don't want to jump on this woman's no. shit either. I just think that this woman has a lot of shit that needs to be looked at and probably scooped up. And I and I actually, you know, totally see your point on that. Yeah. Right. The biggest thing for me that leaps out at me about her stance on things is the separation of church and state. Yeah. That is that is the thing that hits me, slaps me upside the face right away, well, and makes me cringe when I hear what she is saying. As I go, uh, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. Well, even separation of church even and state. if we didn't have a separation of church and state, and somebody wants to say that we have to go to church every Sunday. Whether it's our own defined church, like we, we, you and I even go every Sunday to the secular hub, but there, there might be a freaking Sunday where I don't feel like it and I'm going to stay home. And there might be a Sunday where a religious person doesn't really feel like going to church that day and they want to stay home. What are you going to start doing when people aren't showing up? I mean, is there a grace period? Are you going to immediately arrest us or do I get slapped with a fine? Like, seriously, what is this woman even thinking? Well, you know, and and saying such a thing is really just a statement of position because you're never, ever, ever going to pass a law that says everybody has to go to church. I mean, nobody's going to because it's a non-issue. Can you see pastors spending like the first half an hour going yeah. through roll call no the whole thing is just ludicrous <laughs> Sheldon, so, Chris yeah. here Ruth McLeod here well to be totally honest with you I could exactly envision that because that's what we used to do <laughs> in Scientology are you serious <laughs> yes you, didn't, you like, show up for course you show up for classes in Scientology well, classes, and it starts with a roll I mean, call was, was there like a regular service 
or well, they, they didn't classes. do See, roll calls at Sunday service. I'm just saying that. This, this, what, no, that's what they would do. That's right. That's and what they would have to do. And that's. But uh, anyway, I can't, I can't imagine that. Yes, I, I, I can. I can't get over. Yes. Taking roll like. Yes. Because I'm thinking in college. I even thought it was stupid in college. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, wow. That's, that's, so you know, again, it's it's really just her grandstanding because that's never going to happen. No, obviously not. Right. So it's all just kind of silly. So there you go, folks. A uh, little bit of news for your new year. And lastly, we're just gonna we're just gonna spend uh, a couple minutes on this. It, it, a whole show could be could be spent on this particular thing, but it was just a little thing that occurred to me, and that has to do with your expert versus my expert, right? How do we choose who to believe? Mm-hmm. And again, this could be a really big topic, but I was kind of looking at how do I drill down to something very simple with this? I'm not a scientist. Ruth is not a scientist. Yet we have positions on climate change, for example. Of course. We have that position because we've chosen to believe certain scientists that we've read. And that's really the basis of our, of our choice to, to believe that information. I don't agree with using the term belief. I'm, you know what? I'm, I know. I'm, I know. I'm going to stop you with yeah. every damn word today. Of course. I'm I sorry. know. Just, just nail no, me. Just, nail I, me. I knew I that was coming. I hate when people are like, oh, well, you believe in climate change. No, I understand why it's true. So that's, right. so no, you, I know what you're meaning. I just, yeah, I just wanted just, to point that out. Of because, course. Because people are like, oh, well, you don't believe in God. It's like, oh, you, I no, know. No, I, I, I. I, I and it's and it's and it's again it's a valid point because you go okay well there are facts right but it's like well whose facts are you going to believe right sort and of thing, I, right? I just don't like turning especially scientific thought processes and things into a belief right. because then you have people who are like oh well it's just a theory no bitch you don't understand the term for theory when it comes to scientific but we have to be also honest about the fact that you know when it comes to you and me mm-hmm. who we're just lay people we are right. We are not scientifically educated. We are not. Speak I mean, for beyond, yourself. No. <laughs> beyond, you know, our education. I mean, we're not scientists. No. I, we're I not degreed. Yeah, no. We are not people who have spent hours in a lab, right? Thousands of hours in the lab. We haven't done climate but, model studies. We have not looked at glacial excavations. Right. right? We have not looked at carbon emission studies. Right. We have not done an analysis, and I wouldn't even know where to begin Actually, to do an analysis. Carbon emission studies, I have looked at. Okay, fair okay, enough. But fair enough. you know, we haven't but, looked deep. We haven't written any carbon emission. No, that's true. <laughs> studies, but yeah, you know. And so the point is that, and this is just one topic. I mean, we could talk about GMOs. We could talk about vaccines. We could talk about uh, Doctor Oz's latest diet fad. I mean, there are so many <laughs> things that call for real science by real scientists and there are and there is a lot of real science out there done by real scientists and they publish studies and they publish articles and they go on news and they go on talk shows and they talk about it and we listen to them and decide what we're going to think I won't call it believe we can what we're going to think right about a particular issue or topic based on who we choose to take our facts from right and when you have a consensus view of science, you know, from scientists, you go, okay, well, a majority of these guys who are paid to know what they're doing have spent many, many years to learn what they're doing. And you look at a majority of them and you go, well, okay, you know, sort of a democratic sort of look at this. And you go, well, the majority of these guys have a consensus that, you know, global climate change, mm-hmm. we are changing the environment because yes. of what we do, right? Right. Uh, you go okay. I will. I will choose to follow that line of thought. Right. Right. I will follow with that. And then there's other people, especially now, more so in the last twenty years than ever because of the internet, where people will choose to go into an echo chamber of a minority of consensus, and follow some quote unquote alternative science thought. Yes. Right where one or two scientists or a small group of them who are not with the consensus view might put forward some other idea. Right. Now, just that fact alone does not make them wrong. Right? Copernicus was a yeah. you know, minority view, right, right of right, science. Right, right. So it's not uh, with the heliocentric, you know, theory of of, you know, the earth being the center of the universe, right? 
So it's not the fact that somebody is a lone wolf that makes them wrong automatically. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you choose to, you know, to follow or think. So I thought we'd talk about this for a minute. How do we do this, right? And my only real advice on this as a critical thinker, which is which is what I kind of wanted to throw out here, is to avoid confirmation bias in study of any issue. If you're going to go and look at an issue or study an issue, please avoid confirmation bias. And by that I mean so often we go into looking into something because we've already decided what our idea is or we have a tendency in a direction of what we want to believe or think or how we want to act. And we then find information out there that confirms that belief or that that tendency that we have. And that's called confirmation bias. And I think that as, as critical thinkers and uh, with, with rational thought, you owe it to yourself to go out of your way to find the views that are not yours and look at them honestly and appraise them and maybe be willing to you know accept those views rather than your own and that certainly applies to you know us Mm -hmm. in terms of um any of the topics we bring up and i think that what what i what i think we said last week is the thing that sets us aside is different maybe from some others is we are willing to do that yeah like entertain the concept of the flat earth argument well, we, you know, we... I'm still really frustrated about that one. <laughs> yeah. But we did actually spend a lot of time looking at, you know, the arguments that were forwarded by them. We didn't just say, oh, flat earthers, they're nuts. Yeah. It, right? It, and write them off. It's also why I, I will still go to church if I'm asked. It's also why I will still watch whatever nonsense Ray Comfort puts out. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen all of his movies? I, I, I've seen what you're talking about. Yeah. But I will watch them. And right. I and I will I I will entertain the contents, but in the long run, being able to look at multiple sources for different contracting ideas, but also looking at multiple sources for a similar idea is is the point. Mm-hmm. Um That's right. To be That's able right. to to pick like I'm I'm a big fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing a sweatshirt right now. That's right. I've got his face on my chest. It's kind of funny, <laughs> but you know I don't just listen to this man. You know there's there's a so many different scientists out there, so many different studies going on that you know I look at to be able to put together this thought process and my conclusions that I have. Well, I don't like to say the word conclusion. I don't like any word in the dictionary today. I know. She's just anti-word today. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 there's a lot of words that, that seem so concrete and absolute. And I know that the world is not like that. So I, I don't I don't like to use the word conclusion for for a science term because it may change. Right. So but, conclusion to me makes makes it sound like I have made a final decision. Right. And it's all in the in the usage and implication or whatever, because of course scientists conclude things every day. That's true. Right? Those conclusions are understood to be constantly able to be modified or changed. I we just live in a world where people will take a word and see it as one like we talked about this last week, you know, skepticism. They'll take one word yes. and that's what that word means. And that's the only thing that word means, and they construe what it means and all this. Right. The word theory gets construed a lot. Well, I was just about to say, I mean, that sounds like a nice theory, Ruth, but... Ha-ha! Ha! (laughs) All right, folks. Anyway, I think we've made the point we want to make on that particular topic, because, again, that could be a whole show there, too, on confirmation bias and You just want to go party. You're cutting us off. Well, kind of, but, you know, a little bit, yeah. We are going to go party later. Well, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know we are. So, hey, uh, Happy New Year, people. We hope to have uh, lots of good things happening here on this show and in our lives and in yours in this new year, and uh, always hoping for the best and... Uh, never really expecting the worst, actually. At least that's my my sort of take on things. Yeah, Ruth is looking well. at me funny, but you know that's that's kind of how I try to approach things. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. You damn positive person. I know. God, some people. It's exhausting. Yes. If you have any comments or anything, again, um, go out, check out the Big Short, and uh, let us know what you think. We will see you again 
next year. Next year. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Have a good new year. <laughs> Bye-bye.